Hi, Tara. I see you. Um, so uh, welcome to all of you and thanks for joining us tonight. And by us, I mean myself and Andy Dillon. So Andy um, is, has, uh, he's gonna be joining us um, to facilitate talking circles over the, the seven months. Um, Andy has lived and worked at Menlo for the past three and a half years. And he works on our buildings and grounds and has supported the Menlo community with courses on compassionate communication and facilitates uh, transformation circles when the need inevitably arises in human community. So I'm really happy that he'll be able to join us as we, part of what we're going to do is address how to mourn the unraveling and the unweaving of the web of life with uh, which we are currently in the midst of. So he's going to talk a little bit more about this towards um, the end of my talk. So first, I just wanted to introduce myself a little bit more. I was conceived in London and born in New Jersey. And the reason I'm telling you that is that for whatever karmic reasons, I've had a very nomadic life until my mid thirties. And I think that um, the kind of immigrant and nomadic state of a lot of the population of the United States is um, part of the reason that we are in the situation that we're in. I've been fortunate to continue to travel and I've worked in diverse ecosystems over the years. My dad was a climate scientist for the Navy. And when I was young, he was doing a lot of research around the hole in the ozone layer. <clears throat> and as kids, my brother and I were dragged out to marshes at what seemed to be the crack of dawn for bird watching. And also what seemed to me to be with the oldest people on the entire planet. And I really, I hated it. But fast forward to now, and these days I get so much entertainment out of watching the birds on my feeders and, and throwing out seeds for the naughty squirrels up here in the Panther Kill Valley. Um, so in the mid eighties, I, I was young, I was full of optimism and I set out after my third year in architecture school to work and live at a place called Arcasanti, which is in the middle of the Arizona high desert. Arcasanti was started by an Italian architect named Paolo Soleri as an experimental city. It was started around 1969, 1970. And Soleri had very grand visions of bringing together architecture and ecology. And he had coined the term arcology. It was a wild one and a half years of, I turned 21 out there. It was so optimism or so full of optimism. And I, I still really believe strongly in his vision of modern cities, which are ecologically responsive to their respective bioregions. That was over three decades ago. And I was so certain that by now, ecology would be integrated into all of the systems that we have designing to live on this planet in a harmonious way with nature and all of our elegant designs. But it didn't really turn out that way. Yet I'm here, all of you are here because there still is a thimble full of optimism, which I dip into. And more importantly, I think there's an infinite amount of awe and creativity amongst humans and that the amazing intelligence of nature can somehow be translated into a universal language that we can understand and with our collectively powerful imagination, we can engage in the infinite generosity and forgiveness of this great mother earth. So I'm pretty sure we're all aware of the dire situations that we're in at, the, at a global level. I'm just gonna do a very sad list, but a partial list of the calamities. Um, I just checked right before going on that there are CO2 is up to 417 parts per million in the atmosphere. It really didn't go down during the pandemic. I think a lot of people were hoping it would, but it, it really barely made a scratch. Um, biodiversity collapse, species extinction, ocean acidification, nitrogen runoff, creating dead zones all over the planet more plastic than one can wrap our heads around, the destruction of most of the world's uh, healthy soils, human migration from regions that can no longer support 
human life, floods, droughts, fires. And I read today that there's new statistics that are showing that tropical forest destruction accelerated by 12% in 2020, up from, from 2019. So we know it's bad. And this series of retreats is about solutions, mainly nature-based solutions, um, but also how we can all work from the heart as we move through this very tenuous time. How do we as individuals and how do we as members of communities respond and adapt to ecosystems that are breaking down? How do we measure what we value, uh, which is, a very, for me, one of the most important questions that I have been thinking about. Um, so yeah, there is science, but I think more importantly, we need to deepen our relationships with our respective places and, and figure out how deeply we can love the land and how deeply we can work to protect it and regenerate it. So back to my, my theory that one of the reasons that the USA is responsible for so much environmental destruction, even at a global level, is that we are a relatively young collection of immigrants and nomads and we tend to not be rooted in one place. We're not rooted long enough to understand it, to build a relationship with it, to love it enough and to care for it as a forever place. Um, I don't know if there are cultures that are so, that move so easily and freely as we do as individuals and as families. Um, and of course, there's extreme capitalism and exploitation of resources and humans in the mix too, but that's an, another story. So we certainly have the knowledge and we're, you know, as we have this understanding of science, we have, we're moving from a reductionist worldview where we have picked everything apart to an ecological understanding of interconnectedness and interdependence and interrelatedness. So we know what a red blood cell is. We know what photosynthesis is. We know what the periodic table is and all the elements and what they do. We know how a cat purrs, but we might not know why. So now the challenge is to understand how we fit all of these pieces together and we understand what is the glue, what is the dynamic story that is creating these um, systems which support life on earth? And how can we restore and regenerate these incredibly complex systems? But we have to really be able to understand them. So as humans, we have evolved with languages and languages have evolved with us. We started painting on cave walls. We made marks on clay tablets. We developed number systems and that has led to geometry, to incredible architecture, to quantum physics, but also to a world of complex financial products that maybe Raj understands, but not that many people understand them. We've developed alphabets and poetry and love songs and heartbreaking novels and also complex legal documents that no one understands. And I believe that the next language that we must evolve with is the language of nature and ecology and natural systems. So we need to really work to develop this language into something that everyone understands, a universal language. And this has been my work and my passion for over three decades. And I really believe that if we can get a handle on this as a language, we can make it through this. And you might've read Braiding Sweetgrass by Robin Wall Kimmerer. Um, and she talks about her Native American language having more verbs than nouns. I think it was something like 70% of the words are verbs and 30 are nouns, which is a reverse of the English language because in their language, a tree is a verb because it's treeing. It's alive and it's always moving and changing. A stream is a verb because it's streaming and a cove is a verb. So it's very interesting to me how language can change what, how we perceive the world. Yes, a flower is flowering. <laughs> <laughs> so there's one one species that I just wanted to talk about tonight, which is the oak tree. 
So the family is Quercus. And interestingly enough, some of you might have seen this. The New York Times just did an article about this a couple of days ago. So Quercus, there are about 435 species worldwide in this family and about 90 in North America. In this region, we have red oaks and white oaks and burr oaks and chestnut oaks and a handful of more oaks. So oaks live a very long time. Uh, they grow for about 300 years. They're stable for about 300 years. And then they slowly decline over about 300 years. But that's just one of their timelines. Another is what happens over a year. Their spring, summer, fall, and winter. And then what happens between day and night? And what happens is trees breathe in carbon dioxide and breathe out oxygen all while silently pulling water out of the ground and silently pumping it up, let's say 70 feet to the canopy. So a, a large mature oak tree can pump about a hundred gallons of water per hour up through its this inner, their like hair, um, about the, the diameter of hair that they basically are pumping or pulling water up and is to the canopy. But if humans were to do that, if it would take a, you know, a diesel run generator that you could not have a conversation standing next to because it would be so loud. Um, so, and you might've heard about the atmospheric rivers over the Amazon, which are carry some of the largest amounts of water around our planet. Um, but they're being they're critically damaged right now due to the rapid deforestation in the Amazon. But that's another thread, and we're not going to tug on that one right now. So, in a healthy forest ecosystem, the oak is considered to be a keystone species. It plays host to hundreds of other species. It the it esti the estimates between five hundred and maybe seven or eight hundred species depend on and live. Um, in an interrelationship with oak trees. So birds, caterpillars, mosses, lichens, chipmunks, squirrels, even bears. Um, so if you have a healthy forest ecosystem with healthy oak trees, and that happens to be near your garden or your farm, then you're gonna have a healthy population of birds snacking on the insects, mostly caterpillars, but they're also gonna be snacking on the caterpillars that are most likely ruthless, ruthlessly eating your veggies. So this is just one way of setting up uh, an ecologically biodiverse system, which is also called agroecology, that integrates um, a complex system so that you can have diversity within a garden or a farm system and you don't need to use chemicals. So, <clears throat> What I've just talked about with this oak tree, that's just what's happening above ground. Um, below ground, in the dark, billions and billions of organisms are make up the soil food web and they're busy transferring waste and nutrients into the root system of the tree. So a forest system, a forest soil ecosystem has a high mycelium to bacteria ratio and a healthy garden or farm soil has a higher bacteria to mycelium ratio. But this is the one, of, one of the things that soil scientists are studying right now as no-till is starting to become a common practice in farming because when we till the soil, we break up these mycelium threads. And the, the kingdom of fungi is also a relatively young um, um, field. And it's showing great promise in so many ways, but that's, I'm not gonna pull on that string right now. So <clears throat> underground, it's absolutely teeming with life. It's estimated that a healthy tablespoon of soil has approximately 4 billion. I don't know how you can actually approximate something around 4 billion, but anyway, 4 billion living organisms in it. And the rhizosphere, which is the microscopic area around the root tips, there's a tremendous exchange of information going on. So the waste of one organism is the food for another organism. And these nutrients are being shuffled back and forth and through the root system, which then is growing a, a healthy oak tree. Um, 
And one of the things I love to do is to go back and forth in my mind between imagining the scale difference between the rhizosphere, which is microscopic, and our biosphere, which is beyond comprehensive comprehension. And all this is happening at the same time to support life. So, and then there's also the acorns and mast years. And a mast year is when an acorn tree produces an enormous amount of acorns. And some years they do, and some years they don't. And this is something that scientists still are not quite sure as to why trees, oak trees will produce a lot one year and not another year. Uh, we are fortunate to have some very healthy and mature oak trees up here at Menla and in the Panther Kill Valley. But pulling on another thread, the reality is that we also no longer have top predators to keep the deer and the rodent population in check, which leads to all kinds of other issues, like the fact that the deer browse seedlings and it is very hard for a baby oak tree to establish itself. Um, oh, Peter, it's mast, M-A-S-T, mast year. Um, so, so, you know, an oak tree these days can't really establish itself without the help of a human building some kind of fencing or protection around it to keep uh, deer off of it. And the deer, they eat everything um, because uh, there, there's an overpopulation of deer. <clears throat> and because there's an overpopulation of deer, because we don't have the top predators, the, uh, we had now have an explosion of barberry in Northeast, which is a very, very ambitious invasive species. It spreads quickly, <clears throat> it leaves out early before the forest canopy does. And this shades the forest floor, which suppresses native plants and any wee little acorn trying to sprout out, sprout up and reach the sky is just not gonna happen. So humans can intervene in this. And up here, we have been working really hard to remove barberry um, and nature is very resilient and generous. And it turns out that under these big stands of barberry, and some of them have probably been there for 20 or 30 years, the native seed bank has been patiently waiting to have its chance to greet the sun and the rain and the wind. And so now we have some really sweet little meadows of native plants that are popping up. So one thing that we'll be doing during these seven um, weekends over seven months is watching what's called succession in ecology is how from season to season, a, um, an ecosystem changes as more dominant plants take hold. Um, another problem is that barberry is a host for deer ticks, which carry a very high amount of limes. So, you know, when a top predator is removed from a system, you have a whole cascading of other issues. So, and this is just an example, of when you pull on a thread or you eliminate a thread, the ecosystem, the consequences, um, sometimes we know what's gonna happen and sometimes we don't know what's gonna happen. Our watershed address here in the valley is, um, and this is um, an interesting exercise for all of you to do, is figure out what your watershed address is. Our watershed address is um, the Panther Kill Stream, which starts up here, feeds into the Woodland Valley Stream, and the Woodland Valley Stream then feeds into the Esopus River, and the Esopus feeds into the Ashokan Reservoir. And from there, some of it returns to continue into the Esopus and much of it, uh, but much of it ends up in New York City as some of the cleanest urban drinking water in the world, which is one of the reasons that I think that this valley offers so much is because it is pristine. And there's, again, there's just not that many places that are as pristine as what we have up here. Um, so the Esopus turns north, it goes through the town of Socrates and it spills into the Hudson River. And the Hudson River then feeds into the Bay of New York, which leads into the Atlantic Ocean. So what starts up here ends up in the Atlantic Ocean, which I think is really neat. Um, uh, up here, we do have our own spring and the water is incredible. It's the best water I've ever had. Um, we have clean air, 
clean water, clean food. Um, so, you know, one other kind of back to the sa a sad fact, my sister-in-law works at the UN doing climate change mitigation and reforestation in equatorial regions. And according to her right now, only about 10% of the world has access to both clean air and clean water. So it is really, I, I don't know, sometimes I don't know how I landed here, but it's with such great fortune to have access to um, to what we, you know, to have this. So the UN has declared this up uh, this decade, starting this year to up to 2030 as the decade of ecological restoration. And for those of you who do sign up or you can find it online, I'll offer a link to this amazing document that they put together. And, you know, it's, it's the same thing. It's full of despair, but it's also full of hope. And much of what the document is about is regenerative agriculture, agroecology, small land holdings, biodiversity, and rebuilding our soils. Um, the biomass shift over the past 150 years with our, um, I don't know what the right, with, with us uh, becoming more of an industrial agriculture planet, um, has been really extraordinary. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna now attempt to pull up an image. So this is just the one image that I'm, I wanna share tonight. Terrestrial vertebrae, vertebrate biomass. So you can see 10,000, BCE, it was basically wild animals. By 1900, we had uh, decimated a, a large portion of the wild animal population and domesticated animals, the biomass of domesticated animals was higher than the, the uh, biomass of humans. In the year 2000, you can see that the wild animals, it's in wild lands, it's almost gone. And it's estimated that you can see that last bar there that we could possibly almost wipe out the wild animals and have uh, so many domesticated animals that the, the biomass, it just boggles the mind. And so my question is, and, and I, I don't even want the answer, to this, but I, th I think we all know it is, uh, have we turned our planet into a, an enormous industrial meat factory? Uh, I don't like to think about that for a very long time. So, okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and move on. All right, um, so what is ecology? Um, Sarah, yes, yeah, it is, it's, it's me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in, in massive industrial, um, the CAFOs and, and the big feedlots. I want to make it clear, I'm not against small meat farming, um, you know, holistic land management. And this is something that we'll talk about in the course, holistic land management, rotational grazing, um, and mimicking herd animals is restoring grasslands at such a rapid rate that I think it's surprising everybody who's involved with it. And uh, some people have, believe that if we were to convert into smallhold farming and into um, rotational grazing and small livestock farms, we could pull down um, enough carbon to get us back to 350 parts per million by the end of this decade. But it will take an enormous, enormous, like a 180 in our entire global agriculture system. So, okay, what is ecology? First of all, um, yeah, I want us to recognize that it is a field of science as a field in science is relatively young. Uh, legend has it that it was first used by the German zoologist Ernst Heichel around 1866. He was using it to describe economics of living forms. And we probably all know the root eco from Latin means place or home. And it wasn't really until the 1950s that ecology was recognized as a science. 
but it was still at the time considered a soft science, not a real science. And then the hippies got a hold of it. And then the establishment put up strong walls of resistance. So when I was starting out in architecture in my early professional path, I mostly got blank stares or kicks under the table when I tried to integrate ecology into design projects. And when I was in school, sometimes I think the only reason I got through um, my, my studies is because I had a teacher named Milka Bliznikov. She, and she was an eccentric Bulgarian who seemed ancient to me. She probably wasn't, but she seemed ancient. And, uh, but we would have class at her house so she could drink vodka and smoke cigarettes. I know that probably wouldn't fly these days. Anyway, we kept in touch until about, uh, she died about 10 years ago. And every year she would send me a Christmas card from a box of cards that I, I'm pretty sure she bought in the 70s and it just never ran out. There's always dried glitter falling out of the envelope. But she would always accidentally sign them with, Worm kisses instead of wa war warm kisses, W O R M instead of W A R M. And so I feel like that had some kind of significance as to where I am landing today in great gratitude to the worms. Um, <clears throat> so, fast forwarding from you know 30 years ago, and now it seems like the word ecology and ecosystems and ecological economics and ecological restoration and agroecology, they're popping up everywhere. Maybe it's just because I'm in information overload and I read a lot, but it seems like we are at that turning point. Um, and, you know, I think yeah, one of the other things that amazes me about studying ecosystems is that I'm always in awe by the complexity and the elegance. And I know that I'll never get to the bottom of it. I'll never know everything, which means that my capacity for awe will continue forever. The elegance and the beauty of nature is a constant inspiration and companion. So <clears throat> we will be just exploring the concepts around deep ecology when that was kind of came up in the 80s and that's defined as an environmental philosophy which fosters the inherent worth of all living beings regardless of their instrumental utility to human needs and the restructuring of modern human societies in alignment with such ideas and in this, what is our obligation and what is our responsibility as citizens of this planet uh, to, if we carry such knowledge and at what scale do we wish to work from our own backyards and our families or our patios on up? And back to the language, we'll be um, through this, the goal is to increase this eco-literacy, which is also very much a language of intuition and the heart. Um, and eco-literacy is the ability to understand natural systems that make life on earth possible. And to be eco-literate means understanding the principles of organization of ecological communities and using those principles in turn to create responsible human economics. And in all this, you probably will hear the term system thinking and complexity and holism. Um, you know, these, these words are often interchangeable. So <clears throat> what we'll be doing here in these seven sessions, we will be going from observation to action, to study, to contemplation in a continuous circle. We will be quiet, sometimes very quiet, we will get dirty and we might even get some bloody knuckles. Um, you know, it's, it can be hard work and uh, ecological restor restoration work, I think is some of the, the most rewarding work that there is. Um, and it is important that this is going to be a very physical experience. Um, and as again, we are in a time of such extreme information overload. I remember hearing a statistic that way back in the day when um, people had to walk from village to village or ride a horse from village to village, 
the average person in their entire life probably consumed or was exposed to as much information as in two weeks of the New York Times. And, you know, it's something I personally grapple with is just consuming too much information. Um, so one thing that we will be doing is sharing some of the responsibility of learning about what the individual organisms are up here in the Pantherville Valley and how they are interrelated with each other. Um, and before, about a week before each session, I'll be sending out a list of recommended reading and, and things to watch. So April will be the, the introduction. It still might be a little bit chilly up here, but um, we'll start with our species ID and a lot of observation. There'll be some, definitely some gardening happening, some propagation, some ecological restoration work. May is gonna be a soil deep dive and a, and a, a look at different approaches to agriculture. We'll keep working in the garden. Uh, ramps are up. There is a, depending on the stamina of people, there's a, a good ramp patch. That's a, it's a, it's a hike. Um, but there'll be foraging, spring foraging going on. And within each of these sessions, we'll also be looking at what's going on with the medicinal plants. I've identified about 65 or 70 medicinal plants up here. Um, some of them we cultivate, um, and I think more than half of them are actually wild. And um, June, we're going to look at ecological economics and how we can reclaim our own agency in the concept of what economy and ecology is and how we can redefine human progress in the way and how we measure it. July, we're going to look at big, the bigger picture around water and hydrological cycles. August, we're going to talk about urban ecology. I do think it's really interesting that urban um, environments tend to have a higher biodiversity than some rural environments, just because there's a lot of gardens and people are bringing in plants from all over the world. Um, September, we're going to be looking at forests, grasslands, what are trophic systems, it's gonna be late summer here. Uh, the garden, the garden really peaks in July, August into early September. And then in October, we're gonna be bringing it all together and examining our own ideas around ecological literacy, systems thinking, you know, where biomimicry fits in all of this. And then what, how we have changed our perception of what nature-based solutions could be. And, uh, you know, the act is going to be around using this valley as the laboratory on different scales. So, um, you know, again, it, these sessions can be one-offs, they can be a standalone, but I really would encourage you, if you can uh, fit it into your schedule, to do as many as you can, because it's that observation over an entire season where I think one would gain the most information, the most knowledge. So um, the, the minimum that we're gonna do to make this work is six people. And the maximum, I think we're gonna do 15 or 16 people is, is well where we're gonna max this out. So, okay. I feel like I talked a lot and now I'm going to pass it over to Andy and he's just going to talk a little bit about his intentions and then we can open it up to questions and comments and just general curiosities. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Lisa. I, I'm just, um, I, I'm just really marveling at what an amazing resource you are and, and how, how lucky I feel to just have you on the land here. And you've taught me so much personally. I, I was actually thinking while you were talking about the oak trees of a walk we took, I think last year, and you pointing out all the hemlocks and the, these huge old hemlocks that used to be all over the Catskills and how they're dying off. And, and there was something so um, personal about it, 
that now every time I take that walk, I'm visiting these friends. And so some of them have died. And, and, and there's this sense of sadness and loss, but also like I'm, I'm really getting to know them and uh, or know who they were. Um, so, so I just, I love hearing you talk about all this. Um, so one, one of the things that when Lisa was talking about offering this was, was just this, you know, there's a sadness that comes up uh, around all this. Obviously it's, it, we're, we're in a crisis and how do we hold space for that? And um, I've been doing a lot of work around talking circles and it's a really a great way to hold space for heavy emotions and move through them. And it is so important to feel this, the sense of mourning as deeply as possible. I feel all the emotions, the joy too. And in fact, when we can tap into and feel the mourning and sadness, it, it increases our ability to feel joy. Um, so, so I'm offering, I, I asked Lisa what she thought about this and she was, she was really happy to take me up on the offer, which that I, I would hold a, um, a talking circle on, you know, for, for about 90 minutes during the weekend um, to really take up this task of holding space for mourning um, and grief um, about this, this um, unraveling of the web of life that we're living through. Um, in the rest of the workshop, we'll delve into the wonder and awe of earth connection and this inevitably leads to dealing with this, confronting this crisis. Um, I'll be co-facilitating with my partner, Naomi Vladek, who does a lot of this kind of work as well. And um, talking circles, may, maybe, maybe you, a lot of you already know this, but they're, they come out of indigenous traditions all over the world. And it's, it's a way of holding empathic space for the community to express honestly and listen deeply to one another. Um, and I, I participated in actually a talking circle, which got me thinking about this, dealing with this exact topic. And it, it was just so moving and, and it allowed me to go so much deeper into what, what we're really witnessing, what we're living through. Um, so I think that's kind of all I have to say that we'll just see what, see where we go with it on, on the weekends. And I'm, I'm just really happy for the opportunity to, to, do, to be a part of this community. So I, I feel Thank complete. You. Pass it back to you, Lisa. Thank you so much, Andy. Um, it makes me so happy to have somebody to co-pilot uh, that part of which I think um, Andy has a way better skill than I do on that. After working with, the, with plants as long as I have they don't talk much. So um, sometimes I feel like I've lost a little bit of my ability. <laughs> um, so we're going to go ahead and, and open it up to any questions or comments, curiosities. Um. Uh, I had a question. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, Rajiv. Yes. So uh, I've been following uh, a lot of what Bill Gates has been proposing as solutions. I don't know, Lisa, if you've had a chance, if any of Andy, you've had a chance to go through his book on climate change, solutions for climate change. And one of the things that he's been uh, pushing a lot about, and it kind of makes sense, it relates to the slide which you showed about uh, the biomass of domesticated animals. Uh, so he's been talking about lab grown synthetic meat. I don't know if you've heard of it. Uh, yes, and I was wondering yeah. if, uh, if you've had any thoughts on that, is, is that something like, I think the only conclusion that I could come to after seeing all the data was that uh, one was that either we, you know, decrease the amount of meat we have in our diet or stop altogether if we can, but that may not be an option for everyone. Uh, because we're all habituated to, you know, just having what we are used to having. So, uh, but is that like an, something that you think is a solution? <laughs> yeah. Oh, the lab, uh, that is a complicated one. I don't, you know, in some ways I think because I have, um, 
Luddite in me, it just seems so like science fiction, like, like we're, it's a future that I just don't quite understand lab grown meat. I do think that um, we all need to reduce the amount of meat that we are consuming, but I do think that the holistic land management and the rotational grazing um, and the regenerative agriculture, which is building soils, you know, a lot of people think that the, our forests are our big carbon sinks, which they are, but soils and grasslands and um, prairies and the tundra, that actually holds three to four times more carbon than um than the forest. And I, and I think one of the things about some of, something like, about Bill Gates, that's a very, I call it a tech bro and a money bro, is that there's still this idea that we're going to technology our way out of this problem. And making factory uh, or laboratory grown meat is not pulling down carbon. It's just preventing more carbon from being released. And what I'm interested in is how we can use agriculture to restore our soils, to pull the carbon out of the atmosphere rapidly. Because we, that's what, not only do we need to stop releasing it, we need to pull it out of the atmosphere and get it back into the soils. Because it's essentially, you know, oil and coal, which we have been burning and natural gas, which has come from underground. I mean, that's a whole other long discussion as to where the carbon came from, but it came from, you know, dinosaurs. It came from this, this, the, what is, what is highly compacted plant and vegetable matter under the weight under of from tectonic shifts. And that's what, where the carbon was underground and we pulled it out and we it's come in different forms and we burned it and it's in the atmosphere. So I, I just, I, I am skeptical of, of, techno, of only technological solutions. And I think that's why the ecological solutions are really, really important for us to get a handle on. Did that help? It, it did. Thanks. Thanks. I, I couldn't agree more. I, I'm not a big fan of um, a lot of his work. So uh, I was just trying to take it with a pinch of salt because, I mean, obviously industrial farming is something that we need to address uh, uh, as a society uh, and its role and impact on not only not only the amount of carbon that's released, but how that meat is affecting us and, you know, the cancer rates and all the kind of, you know, issues that we're seeing with our health so uh yeah yeah and i don't know whether that will be resolved by a uh, lab created you know genetically obviously modified you know synthet synthesized uh, meat so uh, yeah it, 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 it i think you've got a better point that we shouldn't focus on how to capture the carbon rather than focus on just the release of carbon uh, yeah and i also think these you know um what are they calling these bird? These ham these fake hamburgers that are made from a plant based. I also think that that they are not a solution yeah. either. A lot of them are made from soy. Yeah, they are, have a lot of ingredients in them. They're highly mm -hmm. processed. Mm -hmm. um, it's you know I I, I think it's it's so i don't know sometimes i don't know why this such a complex topic chose me in this life i really i really don't <laughs> yeah, no, we, we tried all of them we we found them to be pretty average to be honest but we still have them because it still feels better than you know i guess having I know, a, having a regular bug <laughs> so but yeah yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, once I got into the math about how, how how they produce them and how much of soy and how much of, uh, you know, uh, the kind of oils that they use to kind of, uh, and they're big on canola oil, for example, how unhealthy it is. That, that's like kind of stuff is just, it's just kind of selling for a fad, but not really healthy and not really a choice. Uh, 
a viable joy, sustainable joy. Yeah. So Peter, you you just asked, let me let me see if I can um uh you just asked what about regular agriculture? I don't know, how do I find this? It's in the chat, right? Oh, there we go. Um so what is the basic agricultural approach? Well, you know, that's uh so big ag right and industrial agriculture right now it is we basically are growing soy and corn to feed cattle and pigs and they are living in these very confined and unhealthy feedlots so they get pumped full of antibiotics and you know other drugs so that they don't um drop over and die because they're basically living in their own feces. Um, and so I think that the, the answers are that just have to eat much less meat and turn these, any, if, if we are going to continue to have animal agriculture, that we look at the holistic land management as a way to do it. Um, and, you know, mimicking nature, again, this is what we can learn from herd animals. And it's possible and to do it on a pretty large scale to um, mimic the herd animals, antelope and deer and, you know, zebras, whatever, with um, moving cattle and sheep and pigs. But you, the humans have to move them through um, a system and a series of smaller pastures. Because what happens is that they eat the grass, they poop, and um, there are, there's grass seed. It's, it's, pretty, it's pretty complex. I mean, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of videos out there that you can find to watch it. But it's a combination of them eating the grass down to the, a certain level, creating the manure, um, and then, you know, they poop and they, they actually trample it back into the ground and it builds up these layers and layers of very healthy soil, which holds a lot of carbon. And then perennial grasses, which they're eating, develop root systems, which can be 10, 15, 20 feet deep. And that is not only sequestering carbon but is preventing erosion and it's holding water into the soil as opposed to the annual crops of soy and corn which are just destroying the soils every year in order to get um you know the the most amount of meat in the most efficient way um, David Montgomery, who's another amazing writer, he wrote a book called Dirt, The Erosion of Civilizations, which is a fascinating look at humans' relationship with soil over the past, we'll say, 10,000 years. And um, he says that pretty much across the, the board, that human civilizations only last 13 to 14 generations before they've destroyed their soil. And here in the United States, we're right, about, we're right around 14, 14 generations since Benjamin Franklin, basically. You know, and we're, we're in a big crisis mode with soil, for sure. The Midwest and the, the Great Plains, you know, most of that soil now has, has either blown in the wind or it's ended up in the Mississippi and is in... It's created these changing land masses, of course, in Louisiana and going into the Gulf of Mexico, but it also has created, I believe, the largest dead zone in the ocean or is at the mouth of the Mississippi from the nitrogen runoff. So I hope that answered your question. It's, it's just so, again, it's because it's, it's like, it depends on what string you want to pull on. Right. <laughs> and the complexity of it all. Lisa, I have a, uh, anonymous question. Yes. You have, uh, do you have any connection to Vedana Shiva and her work? 
Do you and Menla's staff use a similar practice that she uses? Oh, Vandana Shiva's amazing. Yeah, I love her. I've never met her. I have um, seen her speak. Um, and she's she's just a powerhouse. And the work that she is doing in India is really extraordinary around not only restoring soils, but working on the, the social justice issues with the farmers. The, you know, in India, the farmer suicide rate is really, really high. They, uh, with the green, the so-called green revolution, when chemical farming started to become the norm, industrial farming, uh, big ag really went hard into India. And, um, you know, Raj, you probably know was some of this, um, it's been a while since I've thought about it and, and the, the statistics around it, I don't have accessible in my brain right now, but um, essentially with, with uh, a lot of the cotton that is grown and the grains, a lot of rice in India, the, the chemical, the economics around entrapment of farmers to buy chemicals and patented seeds has created a major economic crisis for small farmers. And in the culture, um, being in debt and being um, kind of beholden to uh, an exploitive capitalist system has created a real social crisis. And they are the, the, just the, the rates of suicide among small farmers, mostly men in India is it's heartbreaking, absolutely heartbreaking. All right, what else we have out there? Yes, and um, feel free to ask any questions about the actual event and how it might work. Would that be okay, Lisa? And yeah, in addition to content and subject matter. And you know, the work, the the weekends also will be, you know, if it's we're we'll be a little bit flexible because if it's raining in the morning, you know, we'll do something indoors. Well, we're we'll we will be very responsive to weather, which is what um, one has to do when working with nature in general. Hi, so, Sarah. Yeah, um, it sounds like it's gonna be a mixture of, um, you know, sort of regular kind of learning, book learning, but, but look with a big emphasis on experiential learning. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, and mm. so it's going to be all day, Saturday and Sunday. Is that how it works? Fr Friday night, all day, Saturday and Sunday morning. And then lunch. And I think just a little bit right after lunch. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So Friday night will be, you know, a, um, well, depending, I mean, I love being outside in the, the long evenings in the, the height of summer, you know, so it'd be nice. We could do a hike um, unless it's raining or unless it's 90 degrees. So it just will be, re will be responsive to what's happening with the weather. Are there, uh, sorry, I, if there are other questions, but um, are there specific um, projects um, that are, uh, it's, it sounded like you mentioned there was some restoration, you know, projects at, at Minla that you want to work with, with the group? There, there are, um, we've been doing, uh, I guess we're in our fourth year now, or is it the fifth year working with Ashokan Streams? And so they work with, they get money from New York um, watershed protection funds. And we have been working on um, removing invasives along the, the pond and the Pamperkill stream 
and then replanting them with natives. So we've probably put in uh, close to a thousand and we, we have some more that I've got tucked away right now. And um, so we'll be doing some planting as well and continuing to work on this riparian restoration work. So that's, that's the ecological restoration part of it. And then there's always, um, you know, the, the annuals and the perennials we'll be working with as well. So Tara, what was your question? She says, how, how long, oh. oh, go ahead. How long did it take to grow an entire forest, forest in your land? Oh, it's forever. It never, it never stops. Uh, uh, so we, we don't were, even know when it started. Yeah, but like if you had like a barren farmland, like a reclaimed farmland, just like, you know, oh, plain, oh. How, how long how would long? it, take, would you think it would take to, grow a mini forest back there like what's your estimate um i would say to get to a really good mature forest about 150 years <laughs> 150 years just to go something like that. yeah yeah and that that would just still be a pretty young forest but it would it would start to be really ecologically diverse and I, you know, I also estimate that it takes, you know, you know, when you're starting a new garden or a new project, it really takes three to five years to, for the ecology to find its own balance, you know, and that's, that's really with annuals and perennials, but a forest system, yeah, it's a, it's a long time. Thanks for the question, Tara. All right. Well, it's eight o'clock, so I want to be respectful of everybody, everyone's time. If there's any other questions, I could answer that. If not, we can call it a night.